Thank you for <clears throat> being faithful to give and for giving, remembering our missionaries in prayer and giving missions. Uh, we appreciate that. Tonight, we have a former pastor who now is owner of a Chick-fil-A and has his own ministry within his own corporation, David Grimm, who was supposed to be part during the stow time of our family series and never got a chance to give his message. He'll be sharing tonight. Along with that, uh, we have the Castillo family given a, a short mission window. They we're going to join Kevin and Cindy Elder in Columbia, so you'll have a chance to bless their ministry. They're going to be an important part uh, of that ministry. So hope you can come back tonight at 6 o'clock and uh, be sure that you realize that the week before Easter is the number one time that whoever you ask, the likelihood triples, quadruples that they'll come with you to church. They're going to probably go somewhere. It's who invites them. So invite them to a place where you know the gospel is going to be given, where the presence of God is. We encourage you to reach out. I, I do want to mention to you that um, uh, Carrie and Pat Spains, uh, they have two children, and their youngest one, Jordan, took his life this past week. And um, uh, I know that leading into that, he was um, we're talking, he had been uh, in a discipleship program and he was growing in love with Jesus and talking a lot about Jesus and he had his faith strong in Jesus and he was making statements like I know for a fact Jesus is on this we was on this earth and he's real and and you know I, I, I do everything I can to serve him and follow him and and uh, through some circumstances uh, he had a moment of not thinking clear and so many times Christians are just there's there's a there's a theology of the past that is so cruel and wrong if you think that because you don't have a chance to ask forgiveness of a sin before you enter into heaven, that somehow by confession that you're made right with God, you're wrong. If you lose your temper and you hop in the car and you're angry and you drive and run into a tree and kill yourself, if you're a follower of Jesus and you have him in your heart, you're trusting in him, that does, but you don't have a chance to repent, that does not mean that you won't wake up in God's heaven. And no one here should judge anybody or let any thoughts like that enter your mind. By his own confession, I truly have a peace. In fact, I will tell you that when they called and told me that, and I hung up and prayed, I knew in my heart, and they hadn't told me a thing, that he had been right with Jesus. And uh, he had struggled with some addiction things, and for several months, he had been totally free from that. And he had one moment that something really unusual happened, and he wasn't thinking clear. And so pray for Carrie and Pat. They wanted me to tell you this because they don't want you to ask about what happened. All they need is for you to be here and just love them, pray for them, send them cards. The funeral, the memorial, the celebration of life, he is being cremated. The celebration of life service is here Saturday, this coming Saturday at 1030 in the morning. And there'll be an immediate dinner afterwards over there for their family and other close friends. And um, so... If you can help with food, Jen Sadoff is our funeral meal director, and there are a few other people that you could talk to because Jen is out of town. If you could help bring a food that will help her because she's out, if you could help bring a dish. And you, Carolyn uh, Hawkins is here. If you find her, she can write your name down and pass it on to Jen. Is that okay, Carolyn? And then I think uh, maybe Carolyn Doggett and uh, uh, Judy Johnson, any of them, if you can bring a dish to share, a, des a dessert or a salad or something like that and then we'll have the uh, prepare that meal and thank you the, for those of you that serve in that really giving way so there won't be a burial the, the meal will be pretty much afterwards around that noon hour or so um this is a very hard thing you know uh, my son was very close to jordan growing up and uh, our family was close to their family so it's very it's really stressful at the close of the service, I'm going to greet for a little while, and then I'm going to leave. I'm driving to Texas to see my mom. I'll be back good Friday night. I'll see you all Easter Sunday. I'll be praying for the choir and the orchestra because I won't get here in time for the Friday night ministry of that. If some of you can come Sunday night to the musical and you would volunteer to help Pastor Anna on Friday night with the little children, whether it's babies, twos, threes, whatever the age is, then would you just see Pastor Courtney, Pastor Anna, any of us pastors will pass the name or call the office. Appreciate that. 
there, uh, I don't know if Erica found it or not, but she's looking for a Daniel Boone Coon hat. If you got a Daniel Bean Boone Coon hat, call Erica Lippincott. I made a little prayer list here, really on my mind this week, the widows and the widowers. I know who you are. I think of you. I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and some of you are on my mind. And I look out this morning and some of them are missing. It's hard sometimes to come alone. Would you all be mindful to watch out for them? Uh, remember to pray for these people. I wrote down Betty Green, Harold Edeker, Brenda Dakey, Junior Van Gorp, who's had a heart deal, but he's doing really good. Both Ray and Nevi are sick. Nevi recovering from a heart procedure, and Ray, I think, has a flu or something, row. And Leland's here, but continue to pray for him. Susan Crookshank, John's wife, is very sick this week. Cheryl Dexheimer, uh, Jerry Burns, who has a heart condition, and um, Cheryl's fighting cancer. Jerry Burns, who has a heart condition, and not sure what to do at his age, and, and he's pretty discouraged, so they reach out to Jerry. Uh, Con Githens, who continues to struggle with his health. Nancy Morris, fighting that cancer. Uh, uh, did I mention Betty Green? And, and Griffin Phipps and uh, Xander Cross, uh, little children that are in our church. And I'd appreciate that you just keep them in your prayers, if you don't, if you don't mind. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be here. Father, today is your day. It's a Palm Sunday, the day that the people, some, a few that knew who you were, but most didn't, looking for an earthly king and, and thankful for all the miracles indeed and giving God for all, glory for all the miracles and who they saw you as a great prophet, many of them, but didn't really know you as Lord and surely didn't know you were Messiah. I pray, God, that we wouldn't be like that. I pray we would know you and worship you for who you are and all that you do. And we would honor you in holiness. All these people I mentioned, God, and others, that there's so many others I could mention too. I, I know there's so many struggling. Uh, the Rusty, Rusty Miller. I just pray, God, all of these people would have be touched by your hand, by your healings, by your glory, by your power, by your strength, by your might. Bring healing, bring strength, bring peace, bring comfort, bring provision. Let your spirit move on all of them. We each one take one, and God will just take them in our hearts and pray for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Message title is Thanksgiving, Praise, and Worship. Thanksgiving, Praise, and Worship. Um, Psalm 100 says this, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. That flows out of thankfulness, doesn't it? Know that the Lord is God. One version said, know that the Lord, He is God. There's no other God. He is God. The, it is He who made us. God made you, formed you. From a mother's womb, the Bible tells us, He knew you. At the moment of conception, He knew you. And we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. There's a thing about America and how we view life and religion. The same way on that Palm Sunday, many of the people that were praising or saying, Blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord and declaring of the great things that Jesus had done, didn't fully understand and know him of who he was. Same today, we have a situation where through our American eyes, the way we thank God and the way we praise God has a lot to do with our American life. What is the goal of your life? Is it to be happy and comfortable, be entertained, be fed, kept warm, enjoy family, enjoy life? What is the goal of your life? What is the calling of your life? What is Jesus' words to us for our lives? What are we to be about doing, even the same as Jesus about our Father's business? And yet when we thank God, too many times we're thanking God for all the earthly things. Oh, thank you, God, for this great job. Hallelujah. We're excited. Thank you for my car. Oh, man, my car's a good car. Boy, I love my car. Thank you, God, for this, for this uh, uh, my house and my and my family and for health and for strength and for, for, uh, for the, you know, you're blessed. Thank you, God, we won the championship. Praise God. God is good. We won the championship. NCAA championship. Thank you, God, for my lady bears. Thank you, God. <laughs> Is it wrong to give thanks for kinds of things? I mean, no. 
But I don't think biblical thanksgiving involves that because the Bible says we're to set our affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. To seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, heaven. To look to eternal things, things that money can't buy and death can't take away. To envision those things and the things that we're to be thankful for are the spiritual things. The things that Jesus has come and he gave his life for us. That God loved us when we, when we were unlovable and while we were yet sinners. We're to be thankful for our eternity and our home and look forward and knowing that the Lord is going to be with us no matter what we go through. We go through no matter what it is on this earth. We know that God will be with us and he'll either heal us or take us to heaven. We can't lose as long as we're in the palm of the hands of God. Someday we'll either be resurrected but caught up to meet the Lord in the air or someday we'll lay our lives down and then the Lord will raise us up and we'll have a temporary heavenly body with the saints of old there but then there'll come a time when up from the grave we too will rise as Jesus is the first fruits of that resurrection and we need to be thankful for the things that are heavenly minded the spiritual things do you get what I'm saying because if we hang our basket on how good God is based on earthly life Jesus already told us in the world you're going to have tribulation there's going to be trouble Job is a great example so let's be thankful for the spiritual things, the things God has done, that He is good, that His mercy endures forever, that His grace is amazing, it is love, never fails. Amen? Let's be thankful for who God is. Let's be thankful for what He has done. And let's praise Him for who He is. Sometimes our praise is, testimony songs are good. I mean, the Psalms do that themselves. He hath lifted me up out of the miry place, kept my feet on the rock to stay. You know, uh, I will lift up my, you know, they're testimony songs. I get that. It's declaring what the Lord has done. And, and that's great. That's a testimony of thanks and testimony of praise. But I believe, I believe the highest form of praise is declaring who God is. Praising God that He's Almighty. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's with us all the time. He never leaves us. His praising Him that He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is truth. He is grace. He is love. He is merciful. Amen? Praise Him for who He is. Right? The sweet rose of Sharon. Amen? Amen. Yeah. If you go to Israel with us, we'll show you a sweet rose of Sharon. There's no roses. It's not really a rose, but we'll show it to you. So we praise him for who he is. And so many times we praise him because we're kind of up. Or we praise him because it's popular. Or we praise him because we like the song. Or we praise him because other people are praising him. And so many times when we're thanking God in song or in word or praising Him, especially in worship service, we're not even really tuned in to what the song is saying, the thanks, thankful words or the praise is saying. We're, we're dismissing it. I mean, the words of this morning of all of those songs, they were so rich, they were so full, they were so powerful. It, it, I don't know, I, I mean, I, both services, I just, the Holy Spirit came over me and I, I couldn't, withhold all of the, the passion and the emotion and the tears and just my being just being engulfed in that moment. And we need to understand, not just be ritual, not just our words. The Bible says in Isaiah that your lips honor me, but your hearts are far from me. Your mind is checked out, but you're in a worship service. And then worship. What is worship? Well, I believe worship, the word worship, it means in the, the Greek and in the Hebrew, the word it talks both about two things, kneeling down and, and lying prostrate. But in, in our word, English, it's worthiness, worthy of position and power of, of honor, worthy of praise, the one that is worthy. And I think that worship is when you make Jesus Lord. And the popular thing now is to make Jesus our master, our slave rather, make him our errand boy. Make him our, what we need, it's kind of like Santa Claus. Here's what we need, Jesus. And we call on him as instead of bowing down and declaring him Lord. Lord means ruler. Lord means what he says go. Lord means that my book trumps your thoughts. There's a way that seems right to man, the end thereof leads to destruction. God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. The wisdom of man is foolishness. The wisdom of God is right and pure and true. 
And there's a holy standard that God has set before us. And I believe that worship flows out of getting in the right position in your heart. Because you can kneel down or lay down and that doesn't do it. It's what your heart is to make Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the master of your life, and to surrender to Him all, your whole being, and you live for Him fully devoted. That's where we need to be. And it has to be a situation. Now listen, with Thanksgiving, he says, notice, come into his gates with Thanksgiving. You're thankful all week long. When you come in here, you're, you're mindful. You come to church, I'm thankful. And right away, you're just thankful. And you sing a joyful song of gladness, and you're thankful. And then you praise him for who he is because he's been with you all week. And, and you know him, and you know who he is, and you've been in his word, and you're full of God, and you come in and you praise him. And when you go out, you worship him by obeying him. You know, he says to obey is better than sacrifice, right? Jesus said, you say you love me, I don't believe you if you don't obey me. If you say you love me and you don't obey, the words that I speak to you means follow after not being perfect. It means following just like a, a, a captain of a ship sees the stars that direct his course on, a, on an ocean and he follows the course set. There's a way. So we have a way that's Jesus. And our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. We're headed toward God's way, his way, not our way, his truth, not what we think is truth. And he says, you're like the wise man that builds your house on the rock when you obey. But if you don't, you're like the foolish man builds your house on the sand. When the storms come, your house is going to collapse. In other words, your religion was worthless because you believed everything right about Jesus. He died on the cross. He buried in the grave. He rose again. He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. You sing the songs of praise. You can be excited. But until you bow the knee, until you worship by falling on your face before God and declaring Him your Lord and making it personal, that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, not Savior Jesus, but Lord, you'll be saved. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that believe Jesus and like the cookies that He brings, and they've never surrendered their life to Jesus. And America is full of people that are just as clueless about Jesus as the people that were shouting, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord on Palm Sunday. Just as many. Now in that crowd, I believe this, I believe that in that crowd there were people that had been healed, people that had recognized and called Him Savior, and I believe there are people that really got it, but most of them didn't. Now, some preachers all over America, they'll preach today that the same crowd that was yelling, Hallelujah, blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord, is the same crowd that crucified him. But the Bible doesn't bear that out at all. In fact, the religious leaders, with their religious, their, uh, their Jewish guard, it wasn't the Romans they brought, it was Jewish guards they brought to arrest him. In other words, it was totally the church that wanted to get rid of Jesus because he was messing up their business and he was doing miracles and he was getting the attention and people were popular. In fact, it says that they tried to figure out a way to kill Jesus when no one's looking because he's so popular with the people. And they did it and they brought him, they went and got him at night. When he was up on the Mount of Olives, and you can look across, it's about a 15, 20 minute walk to come across from Temple Mount where they would have come, and the, the, the priests and the religious leaders and, and their own guard to arrest Jesus. They would have come across there. They would have been at night. They would have had torches, and Jesus would have seen them coming. It would have taken about 20 minutes. I've stood right there and looked at it and thought about it. About 20 minutes at the most if you're crippled, 35. That'd be me. I'd be... And Jesus could have run because right on the other side of the Mount of Olives was Bethany. Bethany's where Martha and Mary and Lazarus lived, and he visited there and stayed there often. And within 15 minutes, Jesus could have, could have been at Bethany, and then he could have from there got supplies, and he could have been in the wilderness, which was another 10 minutes, and he could have hid in caves, and they would have never got him. But the Bible says there's no way. He told them in the story, he says, 10,000 angels I could call right now. There's no way you can get me. No one will take my life from me. I willingly lay my life down. Out of his love for you, he gave his life. And so, and so he sees them coming. He sees them coming and he willingly submits to the will of God. That's what we need to do, is willingly submit to the will of God, even when it's inconvenient, even when it hurts, even when it costs you something. But no, we're more interested not in sinful stuff in the religious realm, although we have our private sins you nobody wants to know about. No, we want a good life. We want the happy life, the easy life, the comfortable life, the entertaining life. We just want to kind of roll through and we're void of the power of God because we're not living our life listening to the will of God 
that is Lord over our life to speak to us to accomplish on this earth what God has called us to accomplish and be who God's called us to be. I believe the church should be like David Wilkerson, everybody. It shouldn't be a rare thing, Smith Wigglesworth. And I'm preaching to myself today where the power of God is so strong. Just as Stephen, when he walked, cast his, his shadow. And no one in this room is here. And, and people were healed or things happened to them. And that the power of God, the, the person that I, in, the, in their presence that I felt the power of God from most was when I met David Wilkerson. The power of God when he preached, the power of God when I walked up to him. And just think, what if Christians all over that say they're Christians, that show a display of worship, their lips honor me, but their hearts are far from me. What if they truly made Jesus Lord? They truly were part of his mission. What if they truly had the power of God? What if they truly lived a holy life? It would change our world. Let's read the story of the Palm Sunday uh, here in Luke 19, starting in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage, that's about a mile from Bethany, it's on the back side of the Mount of Olives. That's where the, 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 the colt was tied up. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. That's another message. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he, he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks and coat on the coat and put Jesus on it. And as he, was, uh, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, okay, it's the Mount of Olives, they're coming up over the mount from the backside to the side that you can see Temple Mount on. And they're coming down toward the garden. Okay, so they're, they're not over, they're looking over at Temple Mount about a 20-minute 20, 20 walk. They come down. See, there, it paints exactly where, where they are. He goes down the Mount of Olives to a whole crowd of disciples begin joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. I, we might have been on that road in February. There's a road that kind of, it's a natural pathway that you they have a pavement on that kind of comes from that backside over. And when they, he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd joyfully praised God in loud voices for the miracles they had done. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now sometimes we throw Pharisees under the bus. There, there were several sects of Pharisees, okay? The Hasids, Hasidian Jews, that's, that's what Joseph and Mary were, were, were Pharisees. They were Hasids. Now, in New York, they have a Hasidic group of Jews, but it's not the same. They're not the same as in Jesus' day. And the Hasidic Jews taught exactly what James teaches in the book of James and what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount and throughout his teachings. That talk is cheap. Show me your, show me your faith by your works. Right? Cheap talk. Grace, grace without faith and obedience is not grace. There's no grace without repentance. Repentance says, it's me, O oh Lord, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And you call out to Jesus to change your heart and turn from your sin and make him Lord of your life, to turn away from yourself and follow him. And so that's the, fair. but these Pharisees, it's like when you say evangelical, how many different branches of evangelical? It's the same thing. Not all Pharisees were the same. And these Pharisees were of the worst kind and even ruled the temple. They were the religious leaders that were muckety muck yuck yucks. I don't want any part of them. All right? So they said in the crowd to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Wow, what a statement. Are you kidding me? He's asking to get crucified, isn't he? As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Do you think that Jesus looks at the American church and weeps over us? And said, verse 42, if you, even you, had known, only known on this day what would bring, bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. See right there, most of them didn't know. You see that? He's the Prince of Peace. They didn't know. They didn't get who he was. 
The days will come upon you. Now he's talking about 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the temple. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side and they will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you do not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Are we going to recognize the time of God's second coming? Are we aware? Jesus entered the temple courts. He began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Notice that den of robbers. I want you to remember that when I read another verse. Now listen. The religious leaders were corrupt, and it's always about money, it's about greed, it's about power and pride, and about lust. That's what it's always about. And every other sin will fall into the category somewhere. Narcissism to the max, that's America, it's about me. It's all about me, Lord. And people in the pews follow people like that. They follow people on television, everywhere else, they follow people that for the most part, it's about them. It's their kingdom come. Their will be done or the highway. Like it or leap it. Lump, lump it rather. Lump it or like it. I can't remember how it goes. That's, I'm in Iowa. I can't remember. But look, when Jesus entered, he began to drive out those who were selling. They were, they were actually saying, your sacrifices aren't good. So a poor couple would come with a perfectly fine turtle doves, which is the most, least expensive, and say, no, 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 those aren't good enough. Here, you got to buy these. And then they would charge them triple and quadruple. That's what they were doing. They were thieves. They did the same thing to everybody. The sacrifices, they made them buy them in the temple courts. And Jesus took time to make a whip and he drove them out of there. He wasn't an out of control anger throwing a temper tantrum. No, he was under control. He knew what he was doing and he said the right thing and he took the authority somehow to get those money changers out of his house. It'll be called a place of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers every day. He was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they couldn't find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. That Palm Sunday crowd wasn't the one that crucified him. It's the church, religious, the temple people. I've been in the high priest ruins of his house. It was a mansion. Unbelievable. Mosaics, tiles. Unbelievable. Huge. Indoor running water and toilets. And it's amazing, the ruins. You've been, I've been there. I've seen it. And the, and the history records that these muckety-muck big dogs at, uh, in Springfield, I mean in Jerusalem, <laughs> that, 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 that they weren't giving any money to the outward synagogue, pr the synagogue uh, 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 priests. They weren't giving any money to the synagogues, and those people were starving, and yet they were in cahoots with the Roman government and even doing things for them just for money. They were so corrupt, it's unbelievable. And I think the church in America, for the most part, is absolutely corrupt. And I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want you to be a part of it. They say what itching ears, uh, false prophets, what you want to hear. They'll say what is popular for the day. They'll say anything to make you come, keep attendance. They won't bring up any certain sins because you might not like it there and you might just want to leave. Take your money with you. If I say something that's biblical and you can't prove to me it's not biblical, and you want to take your money and leave, I'm sorry you feel that way. I don't want you to take your money and leave. I'm not saying that. But I want you to turn your heart and be convicted of what is true in the Word. So the first thing that I want you to see is true worship seeks the approval of God, not the praise of men. True worship seeks the approval of God, not the praise of men. Why is our culture not changing? How many have watched videos with these popular songs with these big name groups from all over everywhere and they're coming from everywhere. And you see thousands and thousands, like, I mean, 30, 40, 50,000 people in a concert hall. It doesn't matter what city they go to. It's filled with thousands of young people there jumping up and down and the lights are flashing and singing their songs and they're just declaring the glory of God. They're just full of excitement. Why isn't that changing our culture? Why isn't that affecting anything beyond just a moment of declaring? It almost feels like they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand that Jesus is Lord. 
He's not a party. Your praise, when you're, he, the, the, Isaiah said, your lips praise me, but your heart is far from me. If he's not Lord, then all of that praise, I don't care how good the music is. And here's the sign, you're worried, you know, musicians are worried about, and singers, how good the harmony is, and how good the music is, and how perfect everything is set, instead of the God we're worshiping. We're focused on everything else. And I just think American church is, is a church that seeks the, seeks the praise of men. The praise of men, I mean, it's about the preacher. And you got to have 50 campuses so the same face of the preacher's up there, wherever he's at, it's about him. It's about his message. Are you with me? It's about the singers. It's about the musicians. It's about their talent. It's about everything else that we do. It's not about God. It's a pop culture, man-centered religion. And true worship seeks the approval of God. It's not the praise of men. Matthew 6, Jesus dealt with the whole idea of, of what we do, the motive behind it, the heart behind it. And it has to be the heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when he's Lord, then our acts of righteousness are done in such a way it's not drawing stuff. See, humility isn't, doesn't put this person, put themselves down. Humility thinks of others. Humility doesn't even mention self. It's not about self. It's about God and others. That's humility. It's where you realize it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing near the praise. It's where you go like Isaiah, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Come and help me. I'm a, I'm a pastor. That's my calling. But I'm a human. And I have the same, just like Jesus said, the same passion, the same desire, same struggles, same temptations. And I'm preaching to myself, we all need to, to get more about following God in truth and holiness and being about God and not about us. Look at Matthew 6, 1 to 8. And you, you know, I mean, I just throw one more thing out there. I, people say, why is it you let all these preachers preach? Well, I've never seen a church like that. Because they're, they're better than me. I just yell. They preach. That's why. I mean... I had never preached a, not even one sermon as good as Hawkins. Not even one. His worst one's better than my best one. I don't like him for it either. <laughs> Just kidding you. I love you, Don. Look at this, Matthew 6, what he says to us. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men. And when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he's talking about the things we do that affects people caring, social justice, those types of things, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they've already received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what the right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees that what is done in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've already received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward thee, reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they're being heard because they pray on and on and on and on and on and never shut up. Wait a minute, that's the Weaver translation. Because of their many words. They do not, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You see, I, I, I believe with all my heart that we have a problem that men leading on television, on video, on the internet, that it's about them, it's about their kingdoms, and it's they're warring with each other because they want to have the biggest thing. And I honestly don't want the biggest thing. I don't. I care about every one of you. It's hard. If the devil lies to you and says to back, that church is too big, they don't care about it. Just call our cell phone. All of us, we give our cell phones out. They're on the internet. We'll return your call. And if we don't, it'll be me because I'm forgetful. But Jeff is right behind me in that. He's getting forgetful as I am. He's getting old. <laughs> True worship seeks the approval of God, not the praise of men. And listen to this, the approval of God requires holy living. True worship seeks the approval of God. The approval of God and the approval of God requires to live holy. Be holy as I am holy. 1 Corinthians 6, we're in the passage of a study of 1 Corinthians lately, and this is the passage. I'm going to read through verse 20. It says, starting in verse 9, you have your Bibles, mark it, turn to it quickly, or in your device. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. 
those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are, are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive, cheat people, people who cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It's the Bible. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't mean people that have fallen into those sins. It doesn't mean people that are weak, people that have given over themselves to it and live in them. That's the difference. And what I hear from people who push back about preaching living holy is they say, well, nobody's perfect. You sin too. The same grace of God forgives you as it does me. But what they're saying is, I'm living in my sin. And the Hebrew writer makes it plain. You go on living in your sin willfully, that's your lifestyle, a sinful lifestyle. Like, if you're living out of wedlock, can I just make that plain, like for that, that example, right? Or you're, you're, you're living as an, abu an abuser, you're an abuser, and you're living that lifestyle, and, and all of us, we're not perfect, and no, we're not, we need the grace of God every day and the mercy of God. I get that. But the Bible says in Hebrews, it says, when you willfully sin and you live in that lifestyle, there remains no forgiveness of sin as long as you've got that attitude and as long as that's your choice. In other words, I'm paraphrasing, but in other words, you go on there until you repent of that and turn from that and stop that sinning, you're not under grace. In fact, it says you're insulting the spirit of grace and it says you are trampling on the blood of Jesus. And yet, I know people in this church who have that mindset. It's the grace of God, it saves me, and it doesn't really matter what I do because it all, I could never be good enough anyway, and God's grace does it. No, that's not a born-again person thinking. That's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God calls us to His first name. The Spirit of God says, this is my first name, holy. And the Word of God is powerful. It's two-edged sword. It cuts. And Jesus wasn't nice. He told the truth. And if you think I'm not nice, Jesus is a lot less nice than I was, than I am. He was kind, but he wasn't nice. Kind is telling the truth. You think it's nice, you brood of vipers? You bunch of hypocrites, you whited sepulcher full of bones sitting there. You no good religious leaders. You're nothing. You know, not taking his belt and running those money changers. Get out of here. What do you think you're doing? Quit taking advantage of your people and whipping them, whipping at them. That's kind. He wasn't out of control. That's kind. But it's firm. You just like got parents. You better discipline your kids because being nice to them all the time isn't going to change their little wicked heart. <laughs> Kindness. Kindness corrects. You got a sinful, selfish kid. Every kid is born narcissistic. They're the center of the universe. You got to break them of that and see that they need Jesus to change that heart every time. Point them back to Jesus. Now, where was I? Because that wasn't even in there. <laughs> Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 6. You say, I'm allowed to do anything. <laughs> I can do whatever I want, man. I'm under grace, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. It's true, though someday God will do away with both of them. He's going to do away with stomach and food, I think that's what it said. But you can't say that our bodies are made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us up from the dead by His power, just as He raised our Lord from the dead. You know, why is it that the prevailing thought is to push back anybody to talk about abortion? I mean, some of the states, the things they're passing, I mean, there's been some positive things too. Unbelievable. Life begins at conception, folks. The Bible says that. I don't know that. I'm a, I'm a scientific, not bright. But, but there's a lot of scientific proof of when the heart starts beating and all that. And I mean, what, what we do is we take life out of people. Uh, and, and, you know, all kinds of morality is wrong. And we want to, we got a pet pee, but, but you know what? The church is filled with people that are watching pornography. I just read the scripture to do dealing with that. 
God wants to set you free. His spirit's not weak. His word's not weak. It's that we can't get full of God's spirit and God's word because we're enjoying our American life. And our eyes see God and everything through our American enjoyment of life. That's all it is. They were made, but you can't say that our, bodies were, that, that, that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by His power, just as He raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually part of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. Don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the Scripture says the two are united into one, but, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one. Why? Because it's addictive. The same as drugs, the same as alcohol. You know, lust is addictive. That's why God made the consummation of the marriage, the sex act, is because he wants you addicted to your spouse. And that's why you don't touch or look at a man or a woman or do anything until you're married so that when you go to that bedroom, you're addicted to the person you just married. And when you think pleasure, you think that person. Run from sexual sin because it affects your body. Don't you realize your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. Verse 20, for God bought you with a high price. That's the blood of Jesus. So you must honor God with your body. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he, was, he made it obvious to them. Now that, I think that's picking up maybe in Romans. Is that, uh, I think I'm in, am I in Romans there? 118. Anyway, I'll pick up that because I'm pretty sure that's in Romans. Listen, here's the thing. The Bible says that we're to offer, that to, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the Word of God, don't be conformed to the world, and to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. When he talks about sacrifice, he's talking, he's going back to the sacrificial system of the priest where they would bring animals to offer for their sins. And for us, when we come to Christ out of thanksgiving and out of praise for the fact that we're clean before Him, we offer our bodies. In other words, we say, here we are, we stand clean before you, we live pure before you, we don't give our bodies over to sinful desires. Bottom line. All right, so I'm a little bit confused, but I think I'm in Romans 1.18. God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they clearly see his invisible qualities, the eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. I mean, it's obvious. Look around. Open your eyes. People that say there is no God, come on. I challenge you. First off, Go to Israel, study the land, study archaeology. Tell me that Jesus didn't live. Tell me that David wasn't real. Tell me that Moses wasn't there. Tell me that Abraham and, and Sarah wasn't there. Tell me that all of that wasn't there. Look at the geography of the Bible because the Bible is full of, there's also history books. There's also even a record way back of ancient literature that declares this book is true. You don't need faith to believe the book. And God speaks to all mankind through his creation, through his power, through his glory. You just don't want to be under the power or authority of God. You just don't want to worship by bowing down, by falling on your face before him, by making him Lord and King. You want your own life. And so when you're going to be stubborn when God is revealing himself that way, and you know that God is God, this is what it says in verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him. They wouldn't fall before him. They wouldn't kneel before him. They wouldn't call him Lord. They wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful thing that their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against their natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sex relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. And since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, to say, yeah, he's God. He, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. 
Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Look at this, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception. And let me tell you something. You don't have to be involved in sexual sin to have these sins. You just have to resist making God your king and Lord. You just have to deny him as God and how you live. Then these things come upon you, quarreling, deception, murder, malicious behavior, which is intent uh, to harm and do something against someone, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents, one of the main signs of the income. Let me tell you something, young people. If you're serious about God, and you worship, and you act like you're a Christian, and you're mouthy to your parent, you don't obey your parent, don't even talk to them about your faith. It's like offering a, a sick, lame, diseased uh, animal to God in the, in the temple of God back in the day uh, of, the, of the temples uh, back in the Jewish day. That's what it's like. Don't even tell me if you're going to act that way toward your parents. And they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these types of things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. They recruit sinners to join in. Thus they mock you. Young people, they will laugh at you. They will push a bottle in front of your face and try to get you drunk and take advantage of you. Yeah, they will. They'll trick you into anything they want to do to take advantage of you physically. Just trust me. This world is wicked. When you go off to a secular university, just trust me. Get ready. You're going into absolute evil with a lot of people around you. Not that the person doesn't have some measure, something that needs to be redeemed. Doesn't mean that a sinner is, is totally worthless and doesn't do kind things. Of course they do. I hear, well, I've seen sinners that are better people than Christians. I'm going, probably the Christian isn't a Christian, and the sinner is just not as bad a sinner as some sinners I know. <laughs> That's my answer. Jeremiah 7 says this, You steal, you murder, you commit adultery, perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, says the Lord, and we're, say we're safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers? There it is. You, you, you recognize that? But I've been watching, declares the Lord. Do you think God doesn't see your behavior in church, the way you worship God, where your mind is? Do you think he doesn't see when you leave here and go out there, everything you do about making Jesus Lord and how you live your life, the things you say and the way and what you do in darkness and in the, away from everybody? His eyes are to and fro all over the earth. He sees everything. Look what Psalm 15 says. Verse, there's five verses. This is an NLT. Who may worship in the sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence or your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives. You think holiness doesn't have anything to do with depth of worship and the presence of God? Absolutely it does. And do what is right. Speaking the truth from sincere, sincere hearts. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts. Those who lend money with Without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent and in other words they're not greedy such people will stand firm forever you know you know worship God in his holiness there we go it has to do with being holy so I, 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 I uh, submit to you that true worship seeks the approval of God not the praise of men the approval of God requires holy living and finally and not shortly more shortly true worship gives God the best Malachi uh, 1, 6 says, A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, God says, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? Well, you deplace defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you bring sacrifice to sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Trying to offer them to your governor, would that work for you? Try that. Try it. Would, you be ple would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? A long time ago in the village of Spain, the people had heard that a, a king was coming to, to visit them. And they'd never had a king do that. They were very poor, so they were excited. They thought, what can we offer? Well, they all had wine to drink, and they thought, well, let's, let's get a barrel and each take our very best wine and all pour it in a barrel together. And when he comes, we'll give him a silver cup and let him taste of the fine wine. And so they did so. And so then uh, the king was escorted to the square. 
he was ceremoniously presented the silver cup and invited to draw from the barrel. And he was told the villagers were delighted to have him taste the best, that they had one of the finest. And when they asked him about the drink, he said he announced that was one of the finest cups of water he had ever been refreshed with. Well, the villagers were confused. Had some miracle happened where someone turned the wine into water? Had someone stolen all the wine that was meant for the king? Or well, something quite different had taken place. Each villager had reason in his mind, I'll withhold my best wine and give water instead. There'll be so many cups of excellent wine poured into the barrel that mine will never be missed. After all, was said and done, the king was left with a town full of people who simply went through the motions of showing their love and admiration of him. Are we like that? Isaiah 29, 13, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Pastor Brett, would you come? If you're here this morning and you need to make Jesus your Lord and you need to bow before him, you need to fall before him, you need to walk out of this place and determine what I do in church, what I do when the music turns on is not, is, is, is almost is like offering crippled animals. <laughs> As sacrifice. It's like offering crypt. If you go out there and you, you, you declare one thing and act all excited and you go out there and live like a devil, it just, it's just not it. Keith Green wrote this, make my life a prayer to you. My life may be a prayer to you. I want to do what you want me to. No empty words and no white lies, no token prayers and no compromise. I want to shine the light you gave through your son you sent to save us from ourselves and our despair. It comforts me to know you're really there. Well, I want to thank you now for being patient with me. Oh, it's hard to see when my eyes are on me. I guess I'll have to trust and just believe what you say. Oh, you're coming again, coming to take me away. I want to die and let you live, give. Give your life to me so that I might live and share the hope you gave me, the love that you sent, set, that you gave to set me free. And I want to tell the world out there you're not some fable or fairy tale that I've made up inside my head. You're God the Son and you've risen from the dead. I want to die and let you give your life to me so that I might live and share the hope you gave me, the love that set me free. Jesus said if you keep your life in the end you'll lose it, but if you give your life you'll find life. I hope that we all say, Lord, let us die to ourselves and give and let you give your life to us in us that we can live. There's another song that says, to obey is better than sacrifice. I don't need your money, I want your life. And I hear you say that I'm coming back soon, but you act like I'll never return. Well, you speak of grace and my love so sweet, how you thrive on milk but reject my meat. And I can't help weeping of how it will be if you keep on ignoring my words. Well, you pray to prosper and succeed, but your flesh is something I just can't feed. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want more than Sunday and Wednesday nights because if you can't come to me every day, then just don't bother coming at all. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want hearts of fire, not your prayers of ice. And I'm coming quickly to give back to you. I come quickly to give back to you according to what you've done. I come quickly to give back to you according to what you have done. Faith is dead without works. You can talk all the theology you want. A religion that doesn't change a man is a religion that needs to be changed. It doesn't change your heart. It doesn't give you a heart for the world. Remember uh, Dick Brogdon, what he said? He told his disciples, they were all from Galilee. Jerusalem's quite a ways away, and that's where they crucified Jesus. They hated Jesus. And he told them, when the Spirit comes upon them, he gave them the power to be witness. He said, he says, to Jerusalem, and we say that's our home city. No, it wasn't. Galilee was our home city. Jerusalem was the most dangerous place they could have gone. That's where they put Jesus to death. That's where Peter was afraid after it. 
And he says, go right in the midst. Go right to the most difficult people. Go all over the world. And if you don't have that heart, I'm going to tell you something. You're just like the little sin eraser of Jesus and the feel good and not to have to worry or have any fear or any guilt or any shame of the way you live that's going to bust what hell wide open. Because the heart that's changed has a heart for the lost. Sees the heart. It feels what Jesus feels. It sees what Jesus sees. And he thinks the way that Jesus thinks. And I'm telling you, we need to step it up. And I preach this sermon to myself. And I didn't do this to make you feel bad. You know, what we're doing right here is the least spiritual thing that happens. And yet we judge people spiritually how often they come on Sunday morning. Should you come? Sure. But there's sometimes reasons why people can't. Don't judge them. Because where it happens is at work and, and in your neighborhood. And, and when you get your friends together and you support each other in community and you have a small group and, and you live for God and you pray in your closet and you meditate upon the Word and you're full of the Spirit and full of power and you go into the world and there's glory coming from you to the world. That's what it's about. This is the least of all we do. And yet we make it the pinnacle. Do you hear me? Go be the church. Now here's how we're closing. Write down three things that God speaks to you. Ask, say, God, show me three things I need to quit doing and three things I need to start doing. If you got a pen and a paper, write it down. If you don't, close your eyes and memorize it. Ask God to, to bring to your mind three things you need to stop doing and three things that you start doing. I don't want to hear that one, good Lord. I'm telling you. Number one thing he says to me, I don't, I don't, it's hard. He's asking me what he's asking me is hard. Uh, have us submit. Lord, you, you prayed in the, in the garden. Is there any other way? But yet let this cup come up in the, the thing that's inconvenient, the thing that's hard, the thing that's pains, the thing that's sacrifice. God, we obey to follow it, follow in it. Listen. Listen to God speak and put thoughts in your mind. Every head and bowed and eye closed and you say, I need to make Jesus my Lord. I, I think I might be one of those Palm Sunday Christians that talk about him, know about him, but never really bowed the knee, fallen before him, declared him Lord, King, Master of my life. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here and you say, I need to make Jesus my Lord and my King, would you raise your hand? I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. I, I see your hand. Anyone else? If I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I'll be saved. Jesus, Lord, ruler, master, savior.